Hey everyone, welcome back to Jani.tv, the channel where we dissect and discuss the latest trends and game changers in technology. Before we dive in, if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button and tap the notification bell so you don't miss out on the future updates. Are you ready? Let's get right into it. I'm excited to launch a brand new segment on Jani.tv called Spotlight. Each segment focuses on a startup and analyzes its offerings. Once I share my takeaways with you, I'm going to bring the CEO or CTO of this startup to discuss my observation and share my analysis. Today, I'm going to take a closer look at Fermion, a promising startup from the evolving space of WebAssembly or Wasm. Fermion is founded by the folks from Dice Labs, the same team that built popular tools like Helm, Draft, and some of the other popular CNCF tools. Eventually, Microsoft acquired Dice Labs and the team was chartered with adding the cloud native flavor to Azure. They worked on projects like Crustlet that bridge the gap between the Kubelet, which is the Kubernetes agent, and the Wasm runtime. Based in Denver, Colorado, Fermion is a growing startup with just a handful of engineers. They closed their Series A funding from Insight Partners and Amplify Partners. They also have interesting angel investors like Priyanka Sharma, who is the executive director of CNCF. Fermion has multiple projects. While most of them are open source, the Fermion Cloud is the managed service that has the potential to become a commercial pass offering. Spin is the Wasm runtime responsible for running the bytecode. Fermion Platform is the orchestration tool that brings everything together. Finally, Bartholomew is a CMS that's a workload running on top of Spin. It's more like an example or a sample workload. As a developer familiar with Docker and Kubernetes, this is how I understood Fermion. Spin is comparable to Docker Engine or Mobi. Fermion Platform is the Docker Compose or the Kubernetes. Fermion Cloud is similar to the managed Kubernetes services like GKE, AKS, or EKS. As I mentioned, Spotlight is all about evaluating the product or the platform on the usability aspect. Of course, we also look at developer experience, the overall velocity, and other factors. So let's take Fermion for a spin, pun intended. So in this demo, I'm going to show you three things. One, setting up the spin runtime and scaffolding the default Hello World application. That is the first step. Second step, we are going to deploy it to the local Fermion platform and access the application. Then we are going to see how we can extend this from local hosts to an instance running in AWS. And finally, the same experience extended to the managed pass offered by Fermion. So let's see how this works. So the first step is to get the spin CLI. Now this CLI is responsible for not only dealing with the workloads and deployment, but it also configures the runtime. So let's, all right. So this is installing some plugins and some basic infrastructure needed to run Fermion applications. Once that is done, I need to move the binary to my path, which I have done. And then let's check the version of spin. Okay. Looks like it's installed. Now I'm going to create a new application with spin new. Now this is going to show us an interactive menu. Since I prefer Python, I'm going to choose the HTTP request handler using Python. And then I need to give the name. Let's call this spotlight hello. So I can leave all of this defaults as is and then change the directory to SL hello. And if you look at what this has created, it, it basically created a scaffolded app.py and it also created a TOML file. So let's take a look at these two. So first we look at the app.py. Now, this is not 
very different, except that I was expecting this to use a more standard library like Flask or a Django, but Spin has its own module, and this is how it basically generated the endpoint. So we'll change this. This is the only change I'm going to make to the default one. So Fermion is in Spotlight, right? So we'll save this. Now let's take a look at what's in spin.toml. Now this is a lot like the standard template that we have seen with ContainerD most often. So this has things like what is the component, what is the root, and what is the command to build the application and so on. Now this is very similar to the Docker file. Think of it that way if you come from the Docker background. All right. So now once we have the source code and the Tomel file, we can go ahead and build the application. So spin build. That's it. Now we see a new application packaged as a wasm module. Once that is done, we can literally spin up the application and that's it. So now this is running on localhost. No orchestration required, nothing required. We can just go ahead and do a curl. So let me run this and there we go. So this is pretty simple. I really like the developer experience. We could quickly installed the CLI and scaffolded the Python application, modified something, and we are able to run it. And this is completely portable because it is based on WebAssembly modules or WASM. Okay, now let's see how we can take this from localhost to AWS. So Fermion has built a set of Terraform installers and Terraform templates. So here, let's, uh, go to one of the directories that has all the Terraform variables, parameters, and the, and the Terraform files to basically bootstrap the environment in AWS. So I've already gone ahead and applied this. So currently the endpoints are configured. So I can export all these variables by running this command. Now we can point spin to the hippo URL. So hippo URL is basically how the uh, Fermion platform is exposed. So now I'm going to log into hippo URL and because we have already set the environment variables, it simply logs into the AWS instance and it is running here. So if you see, it's a single instance, t2 small, I didn't do anything, I just did a Terraform apply and it basically spun up the entire environment in AWS. So now spin is pointing to the EC2 instance. So I can go ahead and do spin deploy. Okay, all right, I need to go back to the directory where we have our hello world and then say spin deploy. So now spin deploy is going to take the Wasm application and it is going to push it to the AWS instance that is running Fermion platform. So Fermion platform, as I mentioned, is a composition of Nomad, Vault, and Council, and it is front-ended by traffic. So now while we are waiting for that, I can go ahead and log in to the default Fermion pass. So when I actually do spin login, you notice it is going to point us to the managed version of Fermion pass. So here I just need to copy and paste the code to authorize my application, authorize. And here they should uh, finish the device authorization. And while the application is still waiting to be deployed on EC2, we could successfully deploy it on the Fermion pass. So now, uh, Let's run spin deploy. Now this is actually targeting, okay, the same mistake. I got to be in the directory. So spin deploy. Now we are actually deploying the same application to the managed pass offered by Fermion. All 
all right it should be ready in a few seconds fermion claims in 66 seconds you can have your source code to the production url while it took me more than 66 seconds i'm impressed by the speed i'm impressed by the overall developer experience and i like the fact there is only one tool and one cli to deal with and here is the url to access so we can simply do a curl and fermion is in spotlight perfect so that was a quick demo of installing fermion spin runtime running it locally pushing it to aws and then to the managed pass offered by fermion so that was a hands-on tour of fermion now is the time for the analysis and key takeaways I absolutely like Fermion's speed, developer, developer experience, documentation, and portability. I could go from 0 to 80 in just a few minutes. The ability to deploy code in the local environment, a cloud instance running in AWS, and a scalable managed pass was very impressive. The documentation is rich, and it's pretty comprehensive. However, I had a feeling of deja vu. Trying to run the Hello World Python application, it reminded me of the early days of using LXE or Docker. What's disappointing is the lack of native support for Kubernetes. Fermion is built from the open source projects of HashiCorp like Nomad, Council, Vault, and so on. You cannot bring existing code directly without really rebuilding the code or modifying it for Wasm. Now, interoperability with existing APIs is also a challenge. And integrating with stateful services such as MySQL or PostgreSQL is also not there yet. Let's get Matt Butcher, the CEO of Fermion, to ask some of these questions and share the concerns. Let's put him on spotlight. All right, Matt, welcome to Johnny.tv. And I just had a chance to play with Spin, Fermion Cloud, and the entire stack. Pretty cool developer experience. And I have some questions for you, you know, based on my personal experience of using Fermion and also things that I typically hear from the community. So let me wear the analyst hat and ask you a very typical question to start with. What's your business model? How do you want to make money from Fermion? Well, as a bunch of open source developers, it's really important to us that the that the core piece of the project, which has been, uh, remain open source and be the kind of thing where people can use it anywhere and to do the kinds of things they want to do. Uh, but we do want to pay paychecks. <laughs> and so Fermion Cloud is the area where, you know, we'll be hosting something. We will be dedicating a lot of time and energy to keeping that up and running all the time. So the plan is to uh, continue with the free tier of Fermion Cloud that you tried in that demo just there. And then we'll introduce a, a paid individual tier. And then at some point, a little bit later on, we'll introduce a paid enterprise tier as well. And that's how we kind of imagine us ourselves building up a, a sustainable business model over time. Perfect. So Fermion Cloud, you know, the moment I looked at it, I thought that's the perfect candidate to monetize because it's a pretty smooth experience. You know, that that, that single command of spin login and spin deploy combination is, is pretty cool. It reminded me of my very early days of experimenting and exploring a lot of past services. So cool stuff. Okay. Now, Thanks. you know, when I, um, when I was playing with spin and Fermion, it was a deja vu. It was Docker all over again. <laughs> you know, it's almost like, okay, here is my Flask application. How do I run that inside Docker? You know, that's the first thing that I have done maybe, maybe 2014, 2015, uh, you know, back in those days. So yesterday, when I was uh, playing with Spin and particularly as a Python developer, when I was looking at it, it was deja vu. It was like, it's, it's all over again. So what is, what is your positioning and how do you want to reduce the friction for cloud native developers to come over to Fermion Cloud and Spin? 
So what we looked at, and, and you know, ten, the first 10 of us who started Fermion, we all came out of Microsoft and we had all been working in Azure services for quite a long time. Uh, and, and many of the others who've joined since have worked in places like Google. And we all, one of our shared experiences was that we liked containers when we were building these kind of long running processes, microservices that needed to always be running all the time. But when it came to this kind of serverless approach to development, we didn't find anything that really sort of felt like it worked well for the developer. We also worried that with Kubernetes, and, and again, you know, I, I've been deeply steeped in Kubernetes since it very first came out. But I, I got to admit, it, it's hard for developers, right? The, the Heroku style experience from, you know, a decade and a half ago was much more pleasant than the current experience of building a Kubernetes centered application. So we looked at these two things together and said, you know, what would be great is if we could build an application model that would work really well for the serverless use case where the developer can just sort of zero in on that request response model that they care about getting to, right? The part where all the important business logic sits and we'll just build a really, really good developer experience with that and then tool the entire environment to also achieve the other things they like there, like uh, ultra high performance compared to the two to 500 millisecond cold start times you get in typical functions of service. Uh, and this kind of easy deployment model to a broad, broad number of platforms, right? You can, as, as you saw in your demo, right? You, you can run it locally. You can run it on the cloud of your choice. You can run it in Fermion cloud. That's an experience you don't necessarily get with other serverless functions platforms. So really what we wanted to do is give developers this kind of choice, whether they're writing big, giant virtual machine platform style applications or containers that are going to run in orchestration systems like Kubernetes uh, and be long running processes or serverless functions that they can write and run sort of in the environment they choose, whether that's Kubernetes locally or in Fermion Cloud. Right, right. But you know, one of the big concerns I have as a developer is none of my existing libraries and none of the things that I'm familiar with, for example, talking to a Redis cache and then connecting to MySQL or Postgres or Mongo, none of them come natural to Wasm. I have to do a, quite a bit of plumbing and workarounds to make a simple data-driven application to work. So, so when do you think we'll be ready with those additional services and additional bridges to the stateful world? And the big reason why it hasn't come along really fast is because of the security model of WebAssembly. We want to make sure that we're building an environment that is properly sandboxed because that is part of the uh, the core value proposition of WebAssembly. But the work is coming along quite fast now, and it's all happening under a subgroup inside of the WebAssembly world called the WASI uh, group, WebAssembly System Interface. <laughs> Uh, the version that you tried out today uh, was Preview 1. Uh, preview 2 is coming in a couple of weeks, so it should be over the summertime that you'll see that, and Preview 3 by the end of the year. Preview 2 adds socket support, and that's the big chunk that's missing. Right now, in order to make network connections, we currently have to patch the host runtime to allow HTTP outbound connections or uh, PostgreSQL out outbound connections. Once Preview 2 lands, then native drivers will start working and a huge swath of, of libraries and frameworks that currently don't work in WebAssembly will suddenly start working. The last chunk, the last big chunk is multi-threading, and that's in Wasm uh, Preview 3, WASI Preview 3. Preview 3 is coming late this year. So for big uh, multi-threaded applications, it'll still be a little bit longer. Probably you're looking at like October, November of this year. Got it. Got it. So I've been a huge fan of Dice Labs. You know, I, I remember uh, seeing Helm, uh, Helm.sh, that website, for the very first time at KubeCon inaugural conference in San Francisco in Soma, mm -hmm. one of the small hotels. There was this event called KubeCon, and I was a part of that. And that's where I have seen Helm. And I told myself, oh, my God, this is like a Debian package. This is like app get install. Uh, equivalent of Kubernetes. And since then, I've been following your work, you know, uh, all the way through Crustlet. But I'm actually disappointed that your first choice hasn't been Kubernetes or HD, but you chose <laughs> Nomad, Consul, Vault. You know, you basically built a parallel universe of cloud native. So why did you do that? <laughs> well, uh, so... One of the values of WebAssembly is the runtime is so lightweight that uh, that you can run, uh, you know, about an order or two of magnitude more uh, WebAssembly applications in a virtual machine than you can Kubernetes applications. And so we had, uh, uh, sorry, I should say container applications because I'm going to start, uh, you know, 
uh, splitting hairs here as we go. Our Crusslet was our early experiment into running WebAssembly inside of Kubernetes. We had a, a couple of others that, that didn't quite see the light of day. Uh, one of them was called Walk, W-O-K, which I really liked the name, but we never really got it kind of going. Uh, and we just kept running into roadblocks with parts of the of the Kubernetes ecosystem. Uh, OCI registries, uh, Docker registries were not quite ready. We were just writing lots and lots of code to sort of make WebAssembly act more like containers, which is the opposite of what we wanted to do. Uh, and, and then we started saying, okay, well, maybe if we switch orchestrators and use a process level orchestrator instead of a container orchestrator, we'll make some progress. And so we, we tried out Nomad. And in a weekend of work on Nomad, we got farther than we had gotten on Kubernetes in three or four months. So we just kind of leaned into it and we built out a system, uh, which uh, Fermion Platform is sort of like the reference implementation of that system that uses Nomad and console and Vault. Uh, Fermion Cloud itself runs Nomad and console and Vault. But along the way, two big things started changing. The first one was there, uh, the enthusiasm inside of the Kubernetes community toward WebAssembly really started building. Uh, the second was that OCI artifacts landed and support for OCI artifacts is very broadly implemented. Now, the quick quick story for what an OCI artifact is, is just basically it is, a, a ver it is an alteration of the Docker hub, Docker registry style uh, entries that allows you to store things other than Docker images. And so suddenly we can start pushing entire WebAssembly applications into Docker Hub and into uh, you know Azure Container Registry and into GitHub Container Registry and store them and pull them that way. And that was a huge moment because uh, suddenly then we could start pulling them in Kubernetes and pulling them in Docker Desktop and starting to operate on them that way. Uh, so the, the tide is shifting a little bit. You know, originally I thought it would be years. Uh, in fact, I said many times it would be years before Kubernetes could really sort of catch up to where Nomad was as far as being able to orchestrate non-container workloads. But as far as WebAssembly itself goes, the momentum seems to be building up. So I, I really think that by the end of the year, we'll have two different container orchestration systems to, that, that can both run WebAssembly as, as sort of like a, a top shelf experience, a really good and smooth experience. Got it. Uh, I'm actually a big, big fan of uh, HashiCorp and the Hashi, Star, Hashi stack. Yeah. You know, like I have personally used Nomad for orchestrating processes, irrespective of containers or or uh, anything else. It's it's a fantastic orchestration tool. Yeah. So uh, by the way, I also uh, tried uh, Chris Kubernetes uh, plugin. You know where I could literally target Kubernetes, but I I couldn't build the Docker container uh, from from scratch. You know, that is the mechanism to basically package the Wasm module. And I was thinking, oh, so we have x86, we have ARM, and now we have Wasm. So, so it's almost like yeah. a new CPU that is evolving. Um, so I'll continue to play with the integration between Wasm and Kubernetes, and I will I will come back to you with more details uh, based on my experience. So, um, so one question that I have is, you know, like most of the compute services that start as stateless and 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 then eventually become full blown platforms, do you recommend that the developers look at spin only for stateless and serverless applications? Uh, as of now, is it what it is really meant to be? So uh, in our last release, we made a big change. Prior to that, we had really been telling people this is a great way to build serverless, stateless applications. But one of the things that was always really difficult at the outset of Kubernetes was trying to uh, assist developers in moving from stateful applications onto stateless applications. And then ultimately what happened is we added the stateful services and now they write stateful applications. In this case, we said, okay, how quickly can we get the developer to the point where they can write stateful applications? So when we released uh, Spin 1.2, uh, which was just a, a couple of weeks ago, one of the new features that's rolled in and we started on Spin 1.0 and have been gradually adding to it is, is key value storage that is just built directly into Spin. Uh, and so when you're developing locally, uh, you just import the key value library and you can start storing, uh, storing key value pairs. Now, this is different from what you might be used to. Uh, normally you'd think, okay, well, I set up something like Redis, and I would configure the server and I would inject the you know, URL and the login and the password or the security tokens or whatever into the runtime. And then I'd set up the driver in the runtime and make a connection. Well, the way we did it in Spin is all of that's handled by the host environment itself, by Spin itself, uh, so that it makes the connection and sets everything up securely and connects. In your local development environment, it's actually just storing on disk with the SQLite database. 
But when you push that out to Fermi on cloud and Fermi on cloud bootstraps it, it said, oh, well, they're asking for key value storage all set up and in cloud, you know, high availability key value storage system behind the scenes. And the nice thing is the developer never has to set anything up or manage or anything. It's completely no ops from the developer's point of view. You just import the library and you can start getting and setting keys. That is kind of our pilot for how we think that uh, that, that, that we should sort of appropriately remeld the stateful application and the and the cloud enabled services so that we can still do what stateless intended to do which is build really good distributed applications because we are able to horizontally scale very quickly but also give the developer that that comfortable experience of saying okay well if i want to store something i just drop it in key value storage so the key value storage has been quite successful so we will continue rolling out services like object storage and relational database all in that same way, so that the developer is no longer in the operations business at all. And then behind the scenes, you know, if you were to deploy, say, Fermi on platform, and you wanted to set up for your developers in an appropriate environment, you might choose, all right, well, I'm going to plug in Redis here and Postgres here, and that's how I'm going to provide these kinds of services. But as far as the developer is concerned, you know, they have this nice, straightforward story uh, where it's really just a matter of using local APIs and not managing any external services. That, for us, I think is the vision of how serverless ought to evolve over time, right? To really be serverless um, and and really give the developer that kind of top level experience where they can just focus on writing the code that they care about. Got it, got it. So so Matt, uh, I want you to give a very, very actionable kind of steps to embrace Wasm and Fermion. So I represent a typical Docker and Kubernetes developer or an ops engineer, what are the three things that I need to do to, to uh, start consuming Fermion and also mix and match my container investments along with Wasm investments? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, one of the fun first experiments we built was this uh, silly cat game called Finicky Whiskers. You can play it at finickywhiskers.com. And part of the idea there was to show how we envisioned building applications out of WebAssembly components. And, you know, the easy way to get started is to try, you know, to walk through the spin quick start guide as you did, right? And, and just kind of build your first little thing there. But then uh, in on, on developer.fermion.com, we have this documentation section that's like, here's a number of projects. I think there are eight currently that you can walk through and see how to build something a little more robust. So I would recommend you to know, taking a look at that. Uh, playing games like Finicky Whiskers and then going to read that series about how it works and how we've got containers running in some places and, uh, you know, basically WebAssembly microservices running in other places and a good robust front end running somewhere else and, and see how that pattern sort of unfurls. But the way we envision it working over time is that developers will be able to focus in on small chunks of work. Think microservice architecture, but without the HTTP and the JSON serialization, deserialization, deserialization process. You're just writing functions that do one little chunk of the work and then kind of wiring those up together to build a bigger application experience. And there's one more piece that's coming down the line that'll also come out later this year. Uh, it'll uh, probably July is when we'll likely see the first versions of this. And that's the component model. And the component model will even allow us to do things like load in a library that was written in a different language and compiled to WebAssembly and be able to use those libraries together. So say you're writing JavaScript and you want to pull in this library from the, the, from uh, that does YAML parsing and this library that does, uh, you know, hashing or something like that. You don't even have to know that one was written in Python and the other was written in Rust. You can just import them as if they were libraries written in your local language and start using them. That pattern there combined with the, the microservice architecture and the serverless application environment, I think is gonna make it really pleasant, actually really pleasant and enjoyable for us to be able to write applications without having to sort of continually reinvent the wheel and redo the same chunks of code over and over again. Perfect, perfect. So finally, you know, the, the market is, uh, just evolving, and there are a lot of emerging players when it comes to WebAssembly, Wasm. Uh, so, so what is the single most important differentiator for Fermion uh, when compared to other players in the market? I I think when you look at the market, you're starting to see uh, you know kind of four big domains where WebAssembly is starting to take off. Right there's there's obviously in browser where it all started. Uh, and then there's a side of sort of like the plugin model where people are using WebAssembly as a plugin inside of other applications. IoT is big. 
uh, you know, when when you see Disney Plus and Amazon and uh, and and uh, uh, Apple, uh, sorry, not Apple, it's uh, BBC, all kind of jumping in and, and building and using WebAssembly, you know, the IoT area is going to be big. For us, it's really cloud. Uh, you know, again, having come out of Microsoft and seen behind the curtain and, and, and going, okay, well, there's a lot to be done on reducing costs. There's a lot to be done on increasing speed. There's a lot to be done on making a really delightful developer experience. That's the area where we're really leaning in. And that's the area where we think we can add value. You know, we've, we've talked a lot about working on getting our cold start times down from, you know, AWS Lambda takes about 200 to 500 milliseconds to cold start. We, we've been pushing and pushing. We're down under one millisecond for our cold start time. Uh, and that's really where we want to go. We want to provide this excellent experience that means you can build services that are going to be so blazingly fast that you'll score really high on Google PageSpeed rankings, right? And so easy to use that you'll enjoy doing this and give you enough options so that you can deploy it onto a wide variety of different environments. And then as this component model gets finished up in the standards bodies, that for us is going to open up the big gateway to the next group of things that Fermion wants to build. So, you know, I talk about the component model as a way of using two libraries written in two languages together. But the important uh, underlying technology is really that what you're essentially doing is compiling libraries into WebAssembly components, and then you're wiring the components together at the host layer. And that means that uh, instead of, you know, the way we normally compile code, we copy all the code into the same uh, compilation and linking step, right? And so essentially we're running, in, in the case of Go, one big binary. In the case of something like Node.js, where we've got one big giant source tree that we're running through the interpreter. In this new WebAssembly world, we'll be pulling in different WebAssembly modules and then dynamically linking them together at startup time. Uh, and when you do that, then you can start doing things like saying, okay, when I pull in a YAML parser from the internet, I trust it to parse YAML and to serialize YAML, but I'm not going to give it network access and I'm not going to give it file system access. And you can turn all of those things off for just that library. And then, you know, that other, you know, network Postgres driver library, you say, yeah, I'm going to give it access to the, uh, the network layer, but I'm going to deny it access to the file system so that just in case there's a bug somewhere in that driver, it doesn't have the ability to, you know, read or write any files here. And that idea of being able to start layering new, um, new sets of constraints and new sets of capabilities on, on top of individual libraries, should you need to do that, that's going to change the way we think about security. And when you think about it, the same holds true for observability, right? If I can say, I just want to see how these two are interacting and I want to know what calls are there and why it's slow sometimes and fast other times, you can start doing that. So while today's story is very much oriented around the idea that serverless is, is going to, it can be done better and is, is done better by spin, uh, we're looking forward to this world in which we can start saying, you know, application development itself is going to change in interesting ways and allow us to use libraries regardless of language and to instrument those libraries and observe those libraries independently, uh, that's going to help us long-term build better distributed applications, which is the big goal of Fermion on into the horizon. How do we build better distributed applications? Got it. So so the key takeaway is while the others are focused on IoT, Edge, and a variety of other environments, Fermion wants to be the best cloud experience when it comes to Wasm. Yep. Is that correct? That Got is it. correct. And I must, and I must say, uh, the developer experience is is enjoyable. It's been a delight uh, learning about Spin and Fermion platform, and uh, you know, running it on the local host to AWS, and from there to managed. It was a pretty pretty smooth transition, and the docs are top notch. You know, as a developer, I really loved it. Uh, Thank you. So so I'll continue to play with uh, Fermion Spin, and I will I will try to. Uh, integrate all of them with Kubernetes, and I can't wait to see a pod running inside Kubernetes. Uh, so, so that brings us to the end of today's spotlight section. Matt, it's it's an honor to have you on this. This is the very first inaugural spotlight segment, and uh, I'm I'm thrilled to have Fermian, and I'm looking forward to meeting you in person in Hyderabad, Mumbai, uh, next month uh, for yep. KCD and other community meetups. Yep. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure that, you know, we're so early in the WebAssembly ecosystem that there's still so much room for people to jump in and get their their uh, hands involved in building this kind of next wave of cloud computing. So it's so exciting to talk about this today. Thanks for having me. Great. Thank you.